One and Two Kings is a book of division. Divided loyalty is leading to a divided kingdom. One and Two Samuel gave us high hopes for King David and his successors. One and Two Kings pops the bubble quickly. At first, the kingdom flourishes under a wise king. Solomon is on the throne. These are the glory days. The temple of God goes up and God moves in. The king's palace goes up and the nations come in, amazed and admiring. It's the queen of Sheba who comes in and says to Solomon, how happy your people must be. But soon, the kingdom is divided under foolish kings. That's chapters 10 through to 16 of the second book. A desire for more horses, chariots and wives sees Solomon's wisdom turn to folly and his kingdom split in two. His death brings a battle for the throne, a split in the nation, and two kings at odds with each other in the north and south of Israel. And from this point on, the camera lens goes back and forward from north to south with over 400 years and 40 kings covered. Some rule longer than others. Some rule better than others but none can stop the rot. Not even prophets, great prophets like Elijah and Elisha can turn the tide. And that's the first theme to look out for as you read the book of one to two kings, the wisdom and the folly of man. Both are clear to see and you don't have to be a king to learn from the kings. Their lives inform us and warn us of loyalty and disloyalty to God, of wisdom and folly. Almost inevitably, the kingdom disintegrates in chapters 17 to 25. Because of these foolish kings, and despite the best efforts of some of the better kings, like Hezekiah and Josiah. First, the northern kingdom of Israel is invaded by the Assyrians and the people taken into exile. And then, it's the southern kingdom of Judah's turn, as they're invaded by the Babylonians and their people are taken into exile, out of the land. But fourthly, finally, that the kingdom is not done with, not destroyed. The last few verses end on something of a cliffhanger, as the king of Judah is released from prison, hinting at a future release for the people of Judah. This is not the end. And here the book makes plain both the kindness and severity of God. Sin is dealt with severely. The consequences are dreadful and deserved. But note the kindness of God. When God acts to judge at the end of these books, one and two kings, we don't think, how could God do that? We're left thinking, what took him so long? And the answer is the patience of God, the kindness of God, the grace of God. He truly is The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, who does not leave the guilty unpunished. If Israel are to return, if exile is to end, if this kingdom is to rise from the dead, it will not be because of Israel. It will be all of God. And in this way, a book about division proclaims the gospel and pushes us to Jesus, a king who shares the wisdom but not the folly of these human kings, who shows the kindness and soaks up the severity of the Lord himself. He is Jesus, the son of David, the king of kings.